We've been in a study over the last few weeks, or, or maybe months, I'm not quite sure, um, on this special teaching method that Jesus used that John re records, truly, truly, I say unto you, uh, we have looked at 25 references throughout the book of John. It just absorbs the book of John. And <clears throat> we're now looking at the final one that's given by John in his book. Uh, so we're in 20, 21, 15. So when they had finished breakfast, the, the disciples were in a, th in a moment, you'll see we're in the third uh, post-resurrection appearances. Uh, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, feed my sheep. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. That's interesting because it is the word feed in the concept of a shepherd feeding. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. But good if you got that. And it's a truthism. It is true. And that sort of solved it for Peter. He should have went through all this. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then tend my sheep. Probably your Bible says three times feed. And that's correct. Feed. And so today I want to, what were they doing when this conversation come up? What were they doing? This is the third resurrection appearance. And if you read prior to that, you will see that they were fishing. You know, 21st chapter, they were fishing. They were fishing. Peter has challenged, Jesus has challenged Peter fishing, but he didn't talk about fishing, did he? When he engaged in a conversation with Peter, he did not talk about fishing. He talked about what? Feeding. He didn't talk about fishing. He talked about feeding. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what is the concept that you have today about full-time Christian service? Is it just for some or is it for all? If it is for all, what kind of attitude should I have in my life for that? Because you're always going to be torn between fishing and feeding. You're always going to be torn between them. And what's going to keep you stabilized in the midst of all that is a, a Hortonism. Keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. And so you have to really decide what is the main thing. This will help you make your choice between fishing and feeding will make your choice, make choices in life much easier when you understand what is Christian full-time service. Is it just for Ron Adema? I mean, everybody says, well, I know Ron's in full-time Christian service. What about you? What about you? Well, let me ask you this before I have my prayer. Are we all ambassadors of Christ? Are we all royal priests in the family of God? Are those not full-time Christian service responsibilities? 
Do you not have a spiritual gift? Does not every believer in the church age have a spiritual gift? Yes. We've been, yes, yes, yes. These are all given to you for full-time Christian service. Would you agree with that? They're not part-time gifts. They're given to you by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 6, and he is there forever. These are forever ministry gifts. Of course, we're in all, we are all called to full-time Christian service. Not just Ron Adema. Not just Gary Horton. We are all called. And we all struggle with the same thing, keeping the main thing the main thing. What has God called you in your life to do? We're all gifted. We're all equipped. What is it he's called you to do? What is the main thing? Then keep the main thing the main thing. And I'll show you some things today from this discussion because this is the discussion he's having with Peter, right? But this is the discussion. Why are, Listen, you know what Peter was doing? Let me have a word of prayer. I feel my engine. Let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest for those who are visiting with us here today in the auditorium by automobile, as well as those who are visiting with us by the Internet classroom etiquette. Listen, if you're studying at home and you've got a whole lot of kids, then you need to go to the archives to study this lesson because you need to be able to concentrate and and, and listen to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, minister the truth of the word of God. And if your house is on fire, you can't do it. And your house can be on fire in many ways. A bunch of kids can be running around hollering. and You can have TV going with different channels all over the place, and then you, you call this studying with me. That's not studying with me. So you might as well. Just down, you know, if you can't live stream this, where you can do the same thing we're doing here, concentrate for the next 40 minutes, then pick this up on the archive. You can pick this lesson up when you have an opportunity to sit down, the kids are in bed, and life is a little quieter, and you're less distracted. But in the meantime, for those of us that are at Bible study, the classroom etiquette is you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he indwells you at the point of salvation. He's there to minister the truth of the word of God to your soul. He can't do it if you're carnal. If you're carnal sitting here today, he cannot minister the truth of the word of God to you. So how do I identify carnality? Personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. You should examine them. The Holy Spirit will point them out. You confess them, 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. And it allows the Holy Spirit to maximize this hour of study with you for spiritual goodness in your soul. I give you that moment. This is true for you at home, too. And so, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the ministry of the Holy Spirit within our soul to teach us the truth. Our job is to shut down the interferences from outside so that the Holy Spirit can teach us inside because it's an internal ministry. We learn that in 2 Corinthians 4.16, being renewed daily from the inner while the outer is distracting. The inner is full of power and energy and life. We need to be tap into that inner source of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that be true today, Father, as we look into the Scriptures on fishing or feeding, being able to decipher in our life what is it God has called us to do on a full-time Christian basis and what is that involved in my life and can I find that and then keep the main thing the main thing. Always being able to make my decisions off from that premise of full-time Christian service for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what was Peter doing when he was called? Matthew, the fourth chapter, 18 through 22, tells us he was fishing. He was a career fisherman. This was his career trade and apparently was very good at it. He uh, had partnered up and uh, we would say today franchised. 
it was very successful. Jesus came along uh, and said to him, come follow me. And the Bible says immediately Peter left his nets. He left his business and went to follow Christ. Went to follow Christ. That's a, a special calling into full-time Christian service. That's a special calling within the structure. And Peter responded to it. Now, what's interesting is what that involved. It, it involved absolute dependence on, on the Lord Jesus Christ to take care of him. In the past, he depended on himself in the fishing. Now he's had to surrender all that to Jesus Christ. Whether you have that special calling on your life or the calling that comes with a calling in your salvation, both require you knowing the main thing. For Peter, it was to follow me. Follow me. And it meant, it meant what we say, you know, 724s to follow him. Some of us have that. The truth of the matter is we all have that. It doesn't matter what your vocation in life is. We're all called to follow him on a 724. And it's very important we do that. It's very important. And it doesn't matter where that 24-7 uh, is and how it's divided up in your day. Do you understand that? We are to follow Christ in our life daily, right? Daily. Daily take up your cross. Daily, daily. You ought to look up that word and study it sometime. It's a powerful little word. Daily. And wherever he sends you, you're to follow. And I don't care what vocation you have in regard to this. The reason for it is God has highly equipped us with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, with other spiritual gifts. We are so gifted in the church of Jesus Christ to do great work. Jesus said, listen, we are going to so equip you as a Christian, you will be able to do greater works than when Christ was on earth himself. That's a pretty powerful statement. Would you not agree with that? And it's collectively that we're able to do this. It's collectively that we're able to do that. The dynamics of the church in Jesus Christ, the dynamics of the church in Jesus Christ is where the greater works come from. Well equipped to do everything. Well equipped by grace. Well equipped by grace to do it. But for Peter... He's got to come to some issues in his life that all of us have to come to to keep the main thing the main thing. What would be the main thing for Peter? Well, once Jesus said, Peter, now it was Peter's choice, wasn't it? He says to Peter, come follow me. Peter goes like, I'm in. I mean, he didn't say, well, let, let me go home and talk it over. Too late. It would have been too late. Let me... Uh, uh, I've got a funeral to go to. Let me get through the funeral and I'll be with you. <clears throat> Too late. You see, Jesus did go over this with different people. Lord, I'd like to follow you, but first I've got to do this. Mm -mm, doesn't qualify you. Isn't that interesting? And then immediately he dropped everything and went and followed Christ. At some point in your life, you've got to do that. Now, I don't mean leave your career and your family and all that. I mean, at some point in your life, you have to realize that I'm in, Chris in full-time Christian service. And following Christ, wherever I am and whatever I'm doing is the most important. It's the main thing is the main thing. Let me show you three areas you could improve your life in, which are points of light. You know where to be the light to the world? Let me show you three points of light that are really important that all of us do. Conduct. I can't tell you how many people say, 
The reason I don't do such and such for Christ is the conduct of other people. Now, it's not a legitimate, it's not a legitimate excuse. I'm just saying what people see. I'm just saying what people see. Conduct. Our word. The word becoming flesh and living among men. That's a very powerful idea. It's a point of light. Another point of light of his conversation. You know, what we talk about all the time is what captured. Not what we talk about a little bit of time. For right now, you know, I'm willing to talk Alabama football. <laughs> Come Tuesday, I'm done with it. In other words, there are some things that dominate our life. I'm sure right now Elizabeth is talking about having birth. Uh, it's probably a pretty dominant conversation in her life. February. February, sweet Jesus. So what I'm looking for, February. Afterwards, it won't be. So, so there are some things that, but listen, in all this, are we able to keep the main thing the main thing? Say, do you know what that is in your life? I mean, how are you going to keep the main thing the main thing when you're not sure what the main thing is? When you don't, then you're, you're bouncing all over the place. And so I want to try to help you today with that conversation. I want to try to help you with that. So with Peter, Peter had to come to a place where I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow him. And he followed him all the way up to the cross, the burial and the resurrection. Are you with me? He followed him. And then he stopped. He went back fishing. It's not recreational. How do I know it? Because if he's using a net, you know, it's not recreational if you're using dynamite in a net. That's not recreational fishing. It might have been where you came from, but that's not recreational. Not only that, I know it's not recreational because of the catch. When you read this story, you will find that they fought, fished all night and caught nothing. Jesus comes along and tells them to, and they're only 100 yards from shore, tells them to throw the line over on the other side. And they, the Bible says they caught a, now listen, this is important, they caught 153 top-prized, market-priced fish. Think about that. Who, who was after top market Priced fish. That's what they got. What's God, what is the Lord trying to teach these disciples? He got seven of them in a boat. He got seven of them out there fishing. What's, what's, the, what's he trying to teach them? When they get to shore... He's got breakfast already cooked for seven. You know, I might get up and cook breakfast. Because my life has changed too. I ain't ever cooked for seven when I knew two were eaten. On my hungriest day, I couldn't eat for seven. cooks breakfast there's one guy on the beach and he's cooking breakfast one guy on the beach he's cooking breakfast seven come out of a boat and he sat down I got breakfast for everybody figure that one out he must have known something he must have known the seven guys in the boat a hundred yards from shore that had fished all night and caught nothing. You know what he fed him? Fish. Fed him fish. Ham and eggs have been good for me, but what do I know? I'm a Gentile. Fed him fish. Of all the people to eat fish, this was a group to feed them. Free fish. You ever had a, a big 
a big any have you ever had a big meal with Jesus on fish that was miracle? How about that seven guys? Does this ring a bell? No, I don't think so. What's he trying to teach him? What's he trying to teach him? What's he trying to teach his seven disciples that had left him to follow Christ and now had quit and gone back to the old, the old career? What's he trying to teach him? I'll tell you what he's trying to teach him. What he's trying to teach you, what he's trying to teach me today is my grace is sufficient. Oh, it, listen, it reads good, it lives hard. Because it, it, it's not depending on man, it's not depending on self, it's depending on bo- something outside of both of those in order for you to understand my grace is sufficient. Most of you never know what grace is sufficient until he strips you of everything you depend on for grace to work in your life. You depend on so many crutches for grace to work. You wait till he rips them away from you and then see what you do. You know, most of you, most of you roll over in your belly and whine and cry until you put yourself to sleep. That is when grace is sufficient. That's when grace is the main thing. That's where 100% dependent is upon God Almighty. Learn it before you get between the rock and the hard place. Learn it when you have everything going for you. And then when he takes it all away, God has not changed. You have not changed. Your circumstance hasn't. Nothing else has. Now you're in business. I was talking with a man the other day that came in for prayer. Came into the office, wanted prayer. He says, Ron, a, a few years ago, you remember we prayed? I had this disease. It was incurable. And God did a miracle. I got a retrieve. And for the last, I don't know, years, I've been, I've been free of that. I thought I had a cold. I went to the doctor. I came back, and he says, you've got the same thing worse than you had it before. He said this, and he was distraught. And he said this sickness, the doctor says this sickness is death. I said, that's not true. That might be true for everybody in the world, but it's not true for you, and it's not true for me, and it's not true for any person in my church. That is not true. Don't believe that lie from the pit of hell. You know where death comes from? Sin. For by one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed Unto all men. Don't believe that lie. Sin. Adam's sin produced death. Christ produces life. Sickness is between death and life. Sickness. You know what sickness is for in the Christian life? For the glory of God. John 11th chapter. At the funeral of Lazarus. Mary and Mary and Martha are upset with Christ because he let Lazarus die. His disciples were upset. He said this this sickness that Lazarus has is not unto death. It is unto the glory of God. Sickness is to bring glory to God. You see, it sounds when people say, well, you're going to... Listen, I understand what the doctor's got to say. That's gobbledygook. For the Christian to believe that, that's foolishness. When Jesus Christ conquered sin, he conquered death. He told Mary and Martha, they said, well, I know there will be a resurrection. He said, no, no, I am the resurrection and the life. Death has got nothing to do with this in your life. 
I am the resurrection and the life. I am that now. And that's before he went to the cross. See, what's the main thing? Listen. What does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean that my grace is sufficient? When it's not because you start wobbling in fear if certain things are not met in your life. Because in you, that's what it means for God to meet grace in your life. He asked Peter, a personal conversation. Oh, I said, conduct, conversation, and care. Three points of light that goes from the Christian life. The world watches. Conduct. Conversation and character. He says to Peter in this conversation, he says to Peter, do you love me? A strange question, isn't it? Peter, do you love me? And he used the word agape. It's a relationship word. It's a relationship between a father and a son. For God so loved the world that he sent his only God the son so that you could become sons of God. That's what the story is. The love of God flowed through the love of the son so that he could love you as a son. Agape is a relationship love. Between a, an endearing between a father and a son. Philos is a friendship love. It's a relationship, but on a different level. A much smaller level, I might add, compared to the other one. You know who God is? He ain't your brother. He's your father. Jesus is your brother. And he wants to show Peter, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a status in life that is beyond what you and I have here on the earth. Yes, we're friends. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about stepping into a more supreme role. And Peter doesn't get it. Peter doesn't get it in this conversation. Did he get it? Yeah, he got it. Peter writes about it in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He didn't get it now. Is he being taught it? Yes, he is. Do you love me? And he responds with philos. You know I love you. Jesus asked me again, Peter, do you love me? He responds in philos. You know, you know I love you. Now he's irritated, isn't he? Grieved. You know, there takes several steps to get to grief. He's on the bottom rung. <laughs> And Jesus said, well, if that's the best you got, that's the best we can get. It's amazing what Jesus settles for. And we don't. It's, a, it's amazing to me. I want to talk about Jesus' personal interest in Peter's choices in his future. He went back to fishing. You want to stay fishing or you want to start feeding again? You got a choice here. You can fish or you can feed. It's your choice. It's a personal choice. I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to see what you think about that, Peter. And that's how this whole conversation started. After Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter and some of the disciples went back to fishing to support themselves. How do I know it? Well, I'm assuming that all the nets and the recreation, we're not into recreational fishing with nets. Also, the catch they got. Jesus gave them the catch of their life. He gave them the catch of their life. If there was ever reason to go back in the fishing business, that was it. Because they just got the, he got, he got the deal that led to all the bonuses and big time. Hooray, hooray for you, Peter. You're the fisherman of the year. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
I mean, if there was ever a sign from God that he ought to be in the fishing business, it was today. Because he got the mother load of fish. Is that the lesson he was teaching him? Apparently not. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he gave him two miracles that day. The catching of the fish and the eating of the breakfast. And you know what's interesting in your passage? In verse 12 of our passage, in verse 12, Jesus said to them after the catch, he said to them, come and have breakfast. Look at verse 15. Watch this now. See, you miss stuff like this. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? That's a big deal. It's a bigger deal than you're making of it. It's a big deal. What just happened was a big deal. And here's, here's the message that Jesus is trying to do through physical evidence. Let me show you what he's doing for them. You know, uh, I was raised with a bird in a hand's worth two in a bush. That's the way I was raised. I heard that so much growing up. Bill, did you hear that? Kind of, oh, you betcha. I did. Our, our old people, we, they pounded that idea in us. Bird in the hands worth two in a bush. So make, make sure your dreams have some reality to it. Listen, this is what he's trying to teach him. Listen, who provided the great catch of fish? Say, Jesus, right? Jesus has died. He's been buried. He's been raised from the dead. He's about to go back to the Father. He died. He was buried. He was raised. They thought they were done. Are you with me? So they went back to fishing. I don't blame them for that. They went back to fishing. So he has to go and call them again. Who provided the great catch of fish? Jesus. What did the disciples discover when they got to shore? Grace breakfast. How'd they get the fish? Grace. How'd they get the breakfast? Grace. How many, was prepared? How many people was prepared to be fed? Seven. I mean, seven plates. Enough fish. Oh, I know you like my breakfast. Here, here's some extra. You know, when Jesus, when he, if he feeds seven, he's got enough for 14, right? We learned that. We learned that. All right. What did the disciples discover? They discovered that Jesus, after he died, was buried and raised, was still in the miracle business. <laughs> he was still in the miracle business that this resurrected Jesus could still provide for your needs. And more than that, beyond it, that he was the best fisherman of fishermen. He... So push all that stuff out because none of that has a has anything to do with what you, how you're living. You got that? All right. Who provided the great breakfast? Jesus. What was the doctrinal lesson? Well, that's what we're learning. Listen, I'm still in business. I died on a cross, was buried. That's why I came. I'm up from the grave. I'm still in business. In a few days, I'm going back to the Father. I'm going to be absent from the earth. Guess what? I'm still in business. My call is still upon you. Nothing has changed in your circumstances of life, period. I provided for you then. I provided for you now. I will provide for you forever. It's called grace. My grace is sufficient whether I'm in your presence or absence, I'm always with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Notice what occurred before Jesus began his discussion. He finished feeding them. They sat at the grace table. 
knowing that it had all been prepared by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when this conversation with Peter begins. Jesus showed Peter that he could provide by free enterprise, 153 fish, prime, or by the miracle of grace. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. The, the difference is where is your heart? What is your call I have on your life? Peter, I called you from the fishing business to be followers of me. That's what I called you to be. You know it and I know it. You responded to it. Nothing's changed. That call is still upon your life. And it's changed in that call. That's the lesson for Peter. That is the lesson for Peter. What did Jesus call called Peter to do in his life? To follow him and be a fishers of men. And with that call came, not only are you a fisher of men, you are a feeder of those who are called. Not only are you a fisher of men bringing people into salvation, but you're a feeder of those who come in. I want to show you how to do them both, Peter, in the spiritual kingdom. I want you to be a fisher of men and a feeder of those who are saved. That's the lesson for Peter, in my opinion. And I think that lesson is attached to all of us today. Just because Jesus was going back to heaven does not, Peter, does not mean that Peter is to stop following Christ's call upon his life. That's true for you and it's true for me. And let me tell you, when you find out what the main thing is, the main thing in your life, what this means in your life to be a follower of Christ, that he has preeminence in your life, and when you are, you can go on the job, and he'll bring people, and you'll have a dynamic ministry with them. You'll walk into a supermarket to get a, a loaf of bread and have a ministry with people. Because the main thing is the main thing. The preeminence of Christ in my life is a choice you make. Who is first? And what does that mean? What does that mean in your life? I'll tell you for me. For me, it's a woe calling. W-O-E. In 1 Chronicles, in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, I believe it's in verse, I don't know, 16, somewhere in there. Paul says, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Woe unto me. That doesn't necessarily mean a woe unto you. You know what a woe is? When I know the main thing that God wants me to do and I'm not doing it, woe unto me. Woe unto me if I get distracted. Woe unto me. I would be the most miserable person. If I didn't do what God had put on my heart to do, I, it would be a woe unto me. Uh, I, I would be, set as, woe unto me, not woe unto you, but woe unto me. That's me. There came a point in my life as a believer in Christ where I knew what God, I, I wanted to serve God. I wanted him to the preeminence of my life. I didn't care how that was done, but I wanted to be part of that. And I'm, I'm a guy who had, had, had to be all the way or no way. And so for me, I went, I'm in. And I left my nets. For me. When I played football, I couldn't eat date. I was one of those guys that couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. I could play football and be 100%, love, eat, and drink, and all that business. But I couldn't do both. 
I couldn't, I couldn't do both. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't work. And I couldn't play football and date. Date was too big. You know, I was in high school, hormonal high school. There was no way I could do that. So I didn't date. I didn't date when I, when I, when I played football. I didn't date. I went to dances and didn't date. You know, sock hops. For those who go back that far. Woe unto me. I've seen a few people in my life with this. I saw it with Billy Graham. <coughs> I saw it with Gary Horton. <coughs> I saw it with Rick Hughes. I saw it with Joe Griffin. I've seen this with a lot of people. I saw it with Jack Swan. Al Rosenboom. I've seen this with a lot of people like me. Can't walk and chew gum at the same time. But I'm going to tell you what's true for all of us. You got to know what the main thing and that main thing has got to be the main thing. You must not be distracted from it. Everybody in this room is in full-time Christian service. Not necessarily as like Hort, me, Al, and all these other guys, but you're still in full-time Christian service. And you know what, your, what God has put in your heart to do, and I don't care where that heart moves. That's what you're to do. Keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. Paul. Let me give you an example of Paul. I'll tell you what Paul never was, was part-time. In Acts 18, chapter, verse 3, there were times in his life when Paul had to make tents. He worked, listen to me, he worked five days a week building tents to support his own ministry, not to make a living. To support his ministry, support his life. That's what he did when he didn't have food. He didn't get down on God. He didn't change anything in his life except his work. He met Priscilla and Aquila and worked with them. Free enterprise couple. You know what he did on weekends? So you miss this. Oh, yeah, Paul made tents. Yeah, five days a week. You know what he did on weekends? You need to go back and read Acts 18 like I did. You know what he did on weekends? Went out and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and taught Bible studies. Now, Paul Harvey said, page two. Well, he was a commentator, most of you don't know. Do you know that? See, God will take care of you no matter what. Logistical grace. My God shall supply all your needs. What, when you supply part of him? When Paul went out and made tents, he knew what the main thing was the main thing. I am a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have been called to world missions. I know what my call on my life is. But sometimes I have to work to support my ministry and my own personal life. And I find that to be a privilege. And I find it to be a ministry in itself. Okay, Paul, what about your weekends? What do you do on your days off? You know what he says? I do the main thing. Because the main thing is always the main thing. And woe unto me if it isn't. Still following Christ. Still doing the main thing. He has a part-time tent business and a full-time ministry business. How about that? Because that's the main thing. The main thing is the main thing. Not telling, I'm not telling you you have to, but you need to know what the main thing is the main thing in your life. You need to know when God's grace is sufficient, when it's not. 
Listen, most people think the grace of God is not sufficient when they got enough money to pay their bills. They don't need God. They got enough money. It's when they don't have enough money, they get on their knees and start praying before God. How about staying on your knees? And listen, if you got more than you need, give it somebody who's got a need and tell them how you got it. My grace is sufficient because the power is perfected. The power of Christ is perfected in me. And I do this so that this power perfected in me is able to be manifested and become a witness from me. Did you see that? Well, it's on the bottom of your paper. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. You know? There were times in my ministry when Jane worked full-time and I worked full-time. And I ministered on my, my off days. There was a time when I had a full-time pastorate and went to school full-time and never got him confused. I knew that the, my, full, my main thing was, was pastoring. And I was told I needed that educational business I needed that in order to make this more efficient. I needed that, so I did them both. But when I did them, I knew what the main thing was the main thing. I knew why I was going to school. By the way, it wasn't true. Like so often, you get a diploma. It's Listen, your life may change a lot of different ways, but yours with the Lord does not. He is the same Lord Jesus that walked along the shore and said to Peter, come follow me, and Peter left his nets and went. That same Lord showed up after the death, burial, and resurrection, walked along the shores of the lake and said to Peter, what are you doing? What are you doing? I called you not to be just fishers of men. I called you to be feeders of men. Why are you not feeding? Isn't that interesting? I nurtured you. I grew you up. I developed you to be a feeder of the saved. Not just to save people, but to feed them, Peter. Why are you not feeding? Why are you not feeding? Well, that's as far as I can get today. We'll be back with you next time. To ask Peter, why are you fishing and not feeding? Let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We'll take a 15-minute break. We'll come back to the Eucharist. And I will give you the New Year Eucharist. Let us pray. For those who are visiting with us by the internet, let me encourage you. This lesson has to be heard two or three times. Two or three times. So I'm going to ask you, if you listen in with us today, or if you found us later off the archives, you go back and you listen to this, you listen to it two or three times. You read the passages. You study the scriptures. You listen to the Holy Spirit minister, the truth of life, and you will get something from it today, tomorrow and the, the first time you hear it, the second time and third time. You, you need to listen to things three times that are virtually important, that are really important in your life. Each time you will hear the Spirit of God will teach you a little more until you go like, oh, I think I get that. And so, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way with us today to look at the subject matter. 
There's no way you can absorb all of this in one hit. And I pray for those who are interested in this message. What does it mean? What is this thing about full-time Christian service? What does all this mean? What, what's Ron talking about? May they be diligent to listen to it at least three times before they move on. I pray for ears to hear, a mind to understand, and a heart to believe. May the Holy Spirit bring clarity where there's not clarity spoken here today. May there be clarity spoken by the Holy Spirit who interprets correctly and individually and personally to each person. Pray over this offering today, Father, that you would continue to provide grace for us that we might send the word of God throughout the world and missionaries and ministers. Give us boldness. Give us courage. Give us wisdom of the word of God to be truthful when we state it and stand behind it in Jesus' name. Amen.